Hello, uh, welcome to the ADLN webinar on Voices of the Youth for Democracy. Uh, for those who are not familiar with the ADLN, which is the Asian uh, Democracy Research Network, is a collaborative research network of 21 institutions from 14 Asian countries and has been um, organizing events to enhance democratic unity in Asia. I, I believe this is the 11th uh, event uh, in terms of the webinar. So uh, today uh, we organize uh, very timely and very important uh, the, the topic of discussion here. And we, we are successful to uh, get together and, and uh, invite uh, excellent the pre uh, presenters uh, from uh, the, the, the uh, East Asian region and the Southeast Asian region, as well as South Asian region here. So uh, let me first uh, introduce uh, briefly uh, the, the presenters in the order of presentation here. Uh, the, our first presenter is Mr. Uh, Prawich Watanask. Uh, he is a researcher at the College of Politics and Governance at King um, Plaza Hippox Institute. He is a PhD candidate in political science at the University of Canterbury, New Zealand. He is also a guest lecturer on Thai politics and government course at the Chulang Nong Kong University and a regular speaker for the program Towards Democracy with King Plaza de Pox Institute on the Thai Parliament Radio and the podcast Democracy X Innovation, hosted by the Office of Innovation for Democracy at King Plaza de Pox Institute. Our second presenter is from uh, South Korea, uh, Mr. Kyung Dong Kyle Kim. Uh, he is the CEO and co-founder of W Coding, which is an international programming bootcamp, and the CEO and the founder of the Young Tent, uh, an alliance of youth politics groups in South Korea. He also serves as the board of director of the Youth Politics Academy. Previously, he has served as the former committee chairman of the Future Forum from the Yeoido Institute, the official think tank of the People Power Party, which is the largest conservative party in South Korea. Our third uh, presenter uh, is Ms. Moliza K. D. Swain Strani. She is a researcher at the Center for Political Studies, Indonesian Institute of Sciences. She completed her bachelor degree in government and political studies with a some Kumraudi predicate from Diponegoro University, Indonesia in 2013 and got her master's degree in political science with a Kumraudi predicate from the University of Indonesia in 2017. She has authored several academic publications on electoral studies, women and politics and political parties in national journals, international journals and books. Our fourth uh, presenter will be Mr. Gru Prakash. Uh, he is the national spokesperson of volunteer janitor party and an assistant professor in uh, law at Patuna University. Uh, he is also an author and columnist. He has formerly served as a member of the uh, steering committee of the Australia India Youth Dialogue and as a delegate of multi-regional program of the IVLP held by the US State Department in 2018. Our fifth uh, presenter will be Mr. Senol Waniarakchi. Uh, he is a co-founder and the director of Hashtag Generation, which is an organization led by a group of young tech savvy Sri Lankans working towards building a society where everyone has the skills, information, and tools to be 
active participants in making the decisions that affect their communities, technologies, and bodies. Snell is currently pursuing a PhD at the London School of Economics and Political Science. He also sits on the board of the Innovation of Change South Asia Hub, which is a collective of organizations and human rights defenders working together to preserve the civil space in South Asia. As you can see, uh, we, we have uh, distinguished and very excellent, as well as uh, not only just, just the researchers, but also uh, the, the, uh, the practical uh, practitioners in, in the realm of the youth politics to enhance the quality of democracy in each country, as well as their across the regions here. So today we are going to have uh, some common discussion topic, which include first, the saliency of generational cleavage in domestic politics. Second, the framing and representation of issues pertaining to the youth. And third, how youth participation is organized in politics. It, it, is it conventional political channels or through the social media? And, and fourth, the demographic and socioeconomic backgrounds shaping uh, youth agendas. So those are some broad picture uh, in which our presenters will make their own uh, agenda and, and, and the raise some talking points uh, in 10 minutes. So each of you have 10 minutes to present your uh, ideas and share uh, the, 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 your uh, points with uh, us. Okay, so let me just start. Uh, the first presenter will be Mr. Uh, Plowich Watanasku. You can present the first uh, things here. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Kim. And thank you very much for inviting me to join this panel. I understand I have only 10 minutes, so I will uh, talk briefly about the youth politics in contemporary Thailand. So let me let me start by providing some background about Thai politics first. Thailand is a country of the political instability. In 1932, it has transformed, the country has been transformed from absolute monarchy to the constitutional monarchy and parliamentary democracy. However, there are 12 successful coups and 20 editions of constitutions so far until today. The most recent military coup was in May 2014. The junta led by uh, General Prayut Chan Oshai, the army chief at that time, seized the power from the democratically elected government. And the junta had been in power for five years. They promulgated a new uh, junta sponsored constitution in, uh, in 2017. Two years later, a new election was held on March 24, 2019, after it had been postponed for five times. Uh, in that election, there is one party backed by the uh, junta named Palang Prasharat. Palang Prasharat, actually, they, they, they are the runners up of this election. However, they can form a new government with the help of the junta appointed senator. Because under this constitution, before the election was held, the junta appointed 250 uh, senators who can vote for the prime minister. And yes, at that time, they would prejudice to retain his premiership, right? So, uh, and Prayut still in power until today. So basically Thailand, if, you, if we analyze Thailand in terms of comparative politics, right now Thailand can be categorized as a hybrid regime because yes, we have a constitution, we have an election. However, the military and the other unelected uh, force, you know, can, can retain its power and, and influence through various unelected institutions, for example, the Senate and independent agencies. So I start here first because I would like to provide you some background before I take you to 
the topic of the youth politics in contemporary Thailand. So why why it matters? Uh, the general generational cliffish uh, have not been much uh, debated in in Thai politics until up until the twenty nineteen election. Why? Uh, we have to take we have to look back. The last successful election we had was in 2011, right? And the next election, and the latest election right now, 2019. So it is almost uh, nine, almost eight years. It almost it had been always uh, it had uh, almost eight years. Sorry, that's the call into my my phone. That's that's why I just rejected. Uh, so eight years, we don't know what happened eight years. Imagine that if you are a high school student, right? Not just in the primary school. Eight years later, you are now in the in the uh, university, right? And the high school student, the, the university students are here right now. You imagine that they are under the military dictatorship for right now, seven years. Despite it had transformed to elected government, right? So at that in that election, uh, there is about twenty percent of the voters who are the young voters. So it's so one fifth of the voters in that election. So it matters in the electoral game. There is one party that emerged as the alternative party. It is called Future Forward Party, because this party, you know, the party leader. Uh, he is the uh, uh, charismatic, he has a charismatic leadership and he has a visionary thinking. And this party, you know, offer a radical agenda to reform Thai politics. For example, military reform, uh, rewriting the junta drafted constitution and provide, uh, to, uh, providing a state welfare. And surprisingly, this party, has become the third largest party in the House of Representatives. This party is very popular among young Thais. Uh, however, this party was dissolved by the Constitutional Court in February 2020. And it has been transformed to a new party called uh, Move Forward Party today. From this point, it has triggered the so-called flash mob across the country. Flash mob was, was held across the country in the university, in the, in the school. You know, because this party is very popular among young Thais and it is seen as a new hope for Thai politics, right? However, uh, the, the COVID-19 just, uh, the outbreak of the COVID-19 uh, is, is spread last year, right? right? Uh, the big demonstration started from July 2020. Up until today, they are still protesting. And this movement, the most interesting thing is that this movement is the youth-led movement. So to answer the, the question, uh, the, the youth politics in Thailand right now, I frame it as a libertarian versus authoritarian because they are fighting against the authoritarian regime, semi-authoritarian, I would say. Mm. They proposed three demands, the young ties. The first one, Prayut, Prime Minister, must resign. The second one, the new constitution must be drafted. And the third one, the monarchy, which is the, the most sensitive issue in Thailand, must be reformed. Mm. The most of the protesters who joined the protest, I have experienced by myself last year and up until today, they are the high school student and young and the, the, the university student. So why they come out? They come out because they believe that they are fighting for a better Thailand, to make Thailand a better place for their generation. So the next question uh, that, that the part the the panelists, the, the panel has said for me, what is the most visible forms of the participation for the, for the young Thais? I would say the, the most visible form are both online 
and offline. So online on social media, for example, Facebook, Twitter, Clubhouse, and Telegram, right? They have communicate through this application regularly and uh, every day. An offline platform, which is the protest. And there, there is one activity that I have that I am interested in. It's called hashtag activism. Uh, I, from my understanding, uh, Thailand is among the, the country which has, uh, which has the user, which has uh, the Twitter user the most in the world. And they have typed, you know, uh, Twitter is about, in Thailand, in the past, it's just about the entertainment, entertainment, entertainment sport, for example, especially Korean entertainment. But this day, you know, Twitter has become a political platform. They have, you know, create the, the, the hashtag to, you know, to, to, to push their agenda by, by putting the hashtag, for example. Let it end in our generation, you know. Uh, if the politics is good, we can have a good education, good job, good opportunity, for example. And the millennials, generation said, they are viewing that if the politics is not good, this is the core, core issue for, for their movement. We cannot have a good, you know, good life, good opportunity. However, this is the, the sad, sad, sad part of the story. The current regime, they show no tolerance on any opposition and brutally suppress every protest, even until today. So before I, I conclude my, my, my part uh, in, in this section, session, I would say Thailand right now is at the critical moment. The young Thai you know, want to decide their own future. They want to have a good life. They, they want to to uh, decide their future by their own. But the problem is that the current political system cannot accommodate their needs, especially the current regime. You know, recently, uh, it had been proved that the current regime uh, is uh, incompetent, especially coping the COVID-19 pandemic. So I conclude here 10 minutes right now. Uh, I would say the current regime just only wants to prolong its rule as long as they can. But they are not aware that the wind of change is coming. Uh, this is my, my part and let's get back to Professor Kim. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Your uh, very informative as well as insightful uh, presentation about the situation in news politics in the context of Thailand here. So uh, as we expected, the Thailand is now um, say uh, the 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 uh, experience some some sort of the semi democratic or semi authoritarian uh, the regime here. So uh, even if the youth uh, try to make their voice. Uh, its voice has to concentrate on, as, as you said, the return to normal democracy here. So uh, this is one example that the youth politics has some uh, general trend as well as some particular trends depending on the context of the country that the youth uh, will act uh, in, in terms of politics here. So uh, I think the second presenter, uh, the Kyung Dong Kim, Mr. Kyung Dong Kim, will give us a very uh, interesting uh, comparative perspective, especially the, based on the experience of the South Korea today. Uh, it, it, its experience, in my opinion, has some similarity as well as differences with the, the case of the Thailand here. So uh, just please welcome uh, the second presenter, Mr. Kyung Dong Kim. Okay, thank you. Hi guys. Um, my name is Kyung Dong. Um, my English name is Kyle. Um, it's really a, a privilege to see you guys at least online um, and get a chance to share with you a little bit of the perspective of the current um, political system and entire environment. Uh, but not only that, um, especially the youth um, generation and how they participate and how they represent themselves and how they challenge themselves um, in politics uh, as well at this moment. 
Let me give you a little bit of an introduction about myself first. Uh, um, I, I have my, I, I'm running a software development company for the past four or five years already. Um, uh, but not only that, um, on side side job as a side kind of a professional hobby, I'd say I run an organization called a youth organization called the Young Tent. So the Young Tent it was founded about three years ago as well, and the Young Tent is a kind of an alliance of youth groups, political youth groups in Korea. Right now we have about eight to 10 groups that are participating um, in our events every two to three months. And in the events, um, the purpose of the event is for the, these different youth groups to obviously share their infrastructure, share their um, kind of knowledge, share their um, marketing strategies so that they can form a synergy so that they can have, we can create a bigger voice for all the youth in Korea. Um, so that is a little bit about myself. And um, to give you guys a little bit of introduction about the current political and economic um, situation in Korea. Well, uh, maybe some of you know, but uh, the generational conflict in South Korea is, uh, is quite high among ma ma many major advanced countries. Um, compared to the rapid changes in social economy, a kind of intergenerational cultural lag that has failed to keep up with the culture. Um, this is because Korea, as you guys know, went, went through um, the Korean War back in um, 1955. So what took about 100 to 120 years for some of the Western countries to develop on a cultural basis, it only took uh, Korea about 30, 30 years to catch up. Um, so why I'm saying this is the economic kind of advancement uh, was much faster than the cultural and political advancements in Korea, in my perspective. And as a side effect, a lot of the a lot of the politicians are from money, as it is from all pretty much all the other countries. Uh, however, also in Korea, um, the generational kind of jump for um, younger people to challenge themselves in politics is not too easy. Well, as you know, in the 1950s, Korea was one of the most poorest countries in the world. We just went through our Korean war between North Korea and South Korea. We had no economic experience and was devastated by the Korean war, as you guys know. Um, for the generations born and raised in this era, Confucianism and old customs such as um, you know, men are above women, and etc. Um, was pretty prevalent in, in, in the society, and the state was not in a position to contemplate modern culture or ideas because it, it had to make all our we had to focus all our efforts into uh, economic growth to basically bring bread on the table every night. In the 70s in Korea, the generation has, uh, as a whole, jumped into the democratic movement in a reaction to the repressive regime that happened uh, with um, some call dictator, some call, you know, a uh, longtime ruler, President Park Chung-hee, who was the father of the recently impeached Miss President, ex-president Park Geun-hye. Um, so during his regime for more than 16 years, I believe, um, a lot of um, a lot of youth back then, people who were in their twenties and maybe late twenties to maybe um, maybe early thirties, um, they were in. They they took a lot of action to achieve democracy with their own hands, which they were uh, able to achieve to a certain extent. Now, fast forward to current time. So, born in people who are born in nineteen nineties and the two thousands, who are also called the MZ generation is already living in an era where poverty is not too much of an issue. Of course, there's people who are less privileged than you know most people. However, um, bringing food on the table, at least in Korea, is not uh, not the biggest issue that we talk about. Um, is even for younger generations as well. Um, however, with the rapid um, rapid economic development. 
the 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 the, the, the gap between the haves and the have nots is becoming larger. So that is another issue that we want to kind of discuss maybe in the future as well. Um, so how to increase the efforts of political um, involvement in Korea? Well, there, there was recently a very good news um, in a way. Um, we, first time in our history of democracy and elections in the past 60 to 70 years in Korea, uh, we had uh, we had a we had a uh, one of the two two or three major political parties, one being the right wing and one being the left wing, of course, and one kind of in the middle, a couple kind of in the middle. However, the two major um, one of the two major so the Conservative Party of Korea uh, had a had a party leader election about two months ago, and um, mi miraculously um, 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 from you know, uh, shooting off everybody's expectations. Um, a, a person who's born in eight, 1987, so he's around um, early 30s to mid 30s, uh, called Mr. Lee Jun Sok. He has been elected the party, the party number one opposition party leader in Korea, which brought about a lot of um, sensation and um, expected changes in that realm as well. However, uh, efforts are still needed to expand the participation of young members of the community in making political decisions as well. Um, as I said, uh, the so-called um, silver democracy has started to really, really kick in in Korea from about five years ago, I think. Um, I think last year, officially, Korea's, the entire population of Korea has officially started to decrease. So uh, one person in Korea um, is having 0.98 babies starting from last year. And, um, you know, that is obviously a, a big deal in terms of national, um, you know, national um, uh, um, capital, I guess, uh, assets. However, um, not only that, um, following the footsteps of maybe Japan, um, silver de democracy. So, the majority of the of the of the of the population is becoming old, uh, and and not a, not enough younger people are getting being born, obviously. So you know, being democracy where one vote equal one person equals one vote, with the majority of the political decisions and the majority of the political um, policies are being slowly slowly curated towards um, towards safety. Um, kind of a cons uh, con uh, uh, conservative um, decision for welfare um, and et cetera. I mean, which is not a bad thing, of course. I mean, welfare is necessary in any nation. However, as you can imagine, um, you know, there's a limited amount of assets in any, any group or country. And a lot of that is slowly, slowly being um, uh, spent uh, and focused on, on maintaining the youth and uh, medical services and et cetera, which is obviously, as I said, again, which is essential, however, um, which may not be the best choice for the, the rapid development and rapid kind of coping with, um, um, with changes in, in terms of technology or culture or, um, or, or the youth, basically. So that's being a, a big issue in terms of democracy in Korea. And also in that line, um, I think there was a recent survey in Korea asking younger generations from the MZ generation from the teens to maybe late twenties on uh, whether they believe democracy is the best solution or the best way of governance um, of a country or the world. And uh, a little bit different from even me, I was born in 1982. So I'm already hitting my late thirties right now. But even when I was young, I was kind of, kind of, unconsciously brainwashed that democracy is, you know, we fought for democracy in Korea in the 70s. And, you know, democracy is the only and the and the sacred kind of kind of realm that cannot be challenged or touched. However, um, starting from the kind of the people who were born uh, in, in, the, in the early 2000s, um, democracy is kind of losing, losing its, um, losing its not, not only power, but losing its um, sacred, sacred kind of uh, um, um, image kind of thing, but not, not only that, 
Um, so the, the trust in democracy and the trust in the efficiency of democracy is decreasing. Um, so, 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 and, and, but, and with that, with that, with that, and uh, as I explained, the economic gap between the haves and the have nots that's been accumulating with capitalism over the past 20 to 30 years, there is a, a common kind of void, kind of emptiness in the youth that do not have, well, or, 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 the, or the youth do not, that do not have rich parents, basically. And that leads to what can be dangerous, uh, as you can imagine, populism. So a lot of, um, and, and we have the uh, we have the general uh, we have the president presidential election next year. So the country, at least the politic part, is all around that. And as it is with the rest of the world, the COVID is obviously hitting us hard as well. So with COVID and the national election coming next year. And um, um, the the two opposition parties, obviously, you know, fighting for the for the for the title of presidency. Um, there's a lot of um, kind of false hope and false promises um, concerning, you know, concerning how they will spend the, the national uh, money and how they will give money out to the people and etc. Is kind of being pushed out um, way too much, uh, which leads to a lot of populism. Um, in Korea as well. So that's kind of the situation that we are in South Korea right now. Um, if I have a, maybe a couple more minutes, I want to also emphasize one thing. Um, at this point, there is a conflict today in South Korea, another conflict over what issues should be decided by democratic procedures as well. For some people, for example, as I said, in the seven who were people who were in their twenties in 1970, when, 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 when college students and um, younger people fought for democracy on the streets, and they are called the five, eight, six generation in Korea. So people in their fifties right now who went to school, who went to college in the eighties and um, who were born in their in 1960s. So they were called the five, eight, six generation and who have, who have, who have honestly truly self-gained um, democracy against military dictatorship in their twenties. But funnily enough, well, time-wise funnily enough, in, enough, they are now, the majority of them are now in the pinnacle of the Korean political power right now with the kind of the, uh, um, um, Repu not the Republican, but the uh, liber liberal party, uh, democratic party in ruling right now. Um, but at the same time, what is ironic is that the, they are rather generous about the procedure being less democratic as well. So there is a, a, a kind of a conflict between the 586 generation and the MZ generation already. And um, what is ironic is, um, you know, they fought for democracy and they're, you know, with power comes kind of corruption, of course, and they're the ones who, fun, ironically enough, are in our youth perspective, kind of in the safe realm and trying to um, kind of uh, ignore the negative uh, points of democracy that may be against their, their, uh, their ide ideologies. Um, yeah, so I think that's a good wrap up of, of, of myself and uh, the Korean uh, political kind of situation. Um, yeah, um, I'm curious to hear what other people have to say as well. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much for uh, your the, the extensive uh, the presentation about the situation of South Korea. Uh, as, as we uh, have heard, the South Korea is, I think, uh, some, some exemplary case of uh, some very, very complex issues are now uh, emerging uh, the simultaneously from the uh, say, for example, the demographically low fertility issue and uh, rapidly uh, aging uh, society issues here. And, and um, on top of that, we are now suffering from the increasing the uh, income inequality as well as the asset inequality. So socioeconomic, um, say, the conflict uh, is now are maturing. On top of that, uh, we are also, uh, the the in the shadow of possible populist uh, the the uh, political danger uh, is 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 coming and and 
as, as the, uh, the Mr. Kyung Dong Kim said, the, the older generation versus the younger generation, this generational conflict is one of the, um, the salient issues in, in not only in the electoral politics, but also I think the everyday politics here. So uh, now we have some, some uh, very good contrast, uh, contrasting uh, cases with the somehow some straightforward the voices of the youth in, in Thailand toward the, the, the return to normalcy of democracy versus, for example, the South Korea has the very, very complex, the uh, many, many say, so-called the disease of the advanced countries here, including generational conflict here. So now we have, uh, let's have some third uh, presentation from, the uh, Miss uh, Molizer, Teddy Swain's Tenny, about the situation of Indonesia here. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Professor Kate. Hello, everyone. My name is uh, Molizer Christopher Donna Swain's Tenny. But since it's too long, I know, so you can call me Donna for short. I'm a researcher uh, from the Center for Political Studies, Indonesian Institute of Sciences. And I also a founder of Indonesian's Youth Political Institute. So it's, it's a youth generation that uh, concerned and political education and also youth empowerment. And it's it's an honor for me because I can share uh, my thought here and have a discussion with you all about youth and democracy in Asia. And, and this time I'd like to uh, share you about the youth and democracy in Indonesia. When we talk about youth role in Indonesia, we can divide it to a five timeline in the colonialism, independence, old order, and then new order, and then in the reformation. And the colonialism, the youth movement aims to build awareness and thought about the uh, nationality and then uh, in independence moment, we can say that uh, our independence day cannot be separated from youth rule because in this time, uh, the youth group push the elders one, Mr. Sukarno and also uh, Mr. Hatta, our founding fathers, to quickly proclaim Indonesia's uh, independence day. Uh, as at that time, we, are, we were facing status quo in the end of Second World War, and then uh, jump to the old order, the student movement become the national movement, and in this uh, era we are uh, we were facing cliffage because the student movement or the youth movement that time uh, they they were affected by the political circumstance the the unstable political circumstance at that time because. As a new country, uh, all of uh, the party want to take role in Indonesia. That's why a lot of political parties rose and uh, of course with a very large ideology and it's, it's uh, affect the youth movement that time. And then coming to the new order between 1966 to 1980 and 1998, the young movement here changed to become the controller to the government. So uh, in the past, uh, before the new order, they, they, they were working together with the government, but and start from the new order, they are become controller for the government. And this moment, a uh, student or young movement uh, be, became an instrument in bringing down the Sukarno regime in 1966. And also in the end of this era, in the end of new order in 1998, the student movement again become uh, bringing down the Suharto's uh, regime. What we uh, heard before from Mr. Uh, Watanasu in Thailand, now uh, youth movement is, is kind of like libertarian versus authoritarian and yes that's indonesian movement and the the end of new order when we are protesting of 
the corruption and authoritarianism of the Suharto's regime. And moving to the Reformation, the youth movement become greater and it's not only college student movement, but also high school student. And then uh, it become greater again in this digital era. I have some data here and I'd like to share you about uh, uh, some data of uh, youngs, youngsters sport political participation nowadays. Because when we talk about uh, kinds of generation, we know that uh, we have builders, baby boomers, Gen X, Y, Z, and Alpha. And I'd like to uh, point out about uh, Z generation or some of, and also some of my millennials here, although it's uh, a bit different between Z generation and millennials, but uh, they have uh, almost what a similar uh, characteristic and of course the gen z is is uh, out of mind is more out of mind so this one okay so gen z political character in general have wider spectrum of practice uh, of political participation not only informal political channel and I'm sure that it also happened not only in Indonesia I've heard uh, the uh, last two presenter before me they also told the same thing and Gen Generation Z tends to value diversity wants to be agent of change and target oriented and likes to share but when we talk about uh, political participation today relational in politics. This is a survey done by uh, my research center in uh, 2018. When we, when we asked them about their political interest, yes, unfortunately, they just quite interested to the politics. Then we, when we asked, uh, do you often uh, have a political discussion? Not really. And the use of social media and chat uh, application in reading political news also, uh, it, it's not a good or a great number for uh, youth participation in using social media for politics and share or forward political news also, also no. And then uh, do they really often uh, doing political discussion? No. Complaining to the government? No, not really often. Campaigning? Never. Almost 50%. Uh, the youth never campaigning or, or uh, sharing someone's uh, what uh, political vision mission and there's uh, chat apps. But when we ask them how important is your opinion to be heard by the government, they, they thought that it's quite important. And how likely is the government uh, to hear people's complaint, including you? Yeah, uh, quite likely government will hurt uh, my, either you, my complaints to government. So what we can, infer here, the youth tend to consider themselves and their opinions as an important things to be heard by the government in policy making process. They also believe that their participation will determine the elections of a good leader. However, they are pessimistic that the government will listen to their complaints. That's the things that happened in Indonesia today. And as they 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 are less uh, they, they are a bit pessimistic of their uh, political participation. It also affects the number of young MPs. Only uh, eleven percent of young MPs in uh, our last election is under thirty, and the young MPs candidate by the party, the 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 most party that. Uh, uh, that, that nominate young candidates is uh, PSI. It is a new party that organized by 
young generation. So we can conclude here, uh, this is the elected candidates by age. Of course, when the candidates is low, the elected one become lower. And we can conclude here, the lack of political figures under the age of 30 is caused by the assumption that Politics is a happy narration for the, the youth itself. So the thing that politics is, is not about a daily life, but politics is about uh, a state and any other uh, great uh, narration in, 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 in the world, maybe. And the second one is political education by the political party hasn't followed the dynamics of youth culture. So the political party still organized and in the oldest style, you know, it's it's kind of like um, a bad institutionalism and and it, it's it, it's not uh, flexible as the youth want uh, in in their in their life. And then this is the third one is a quite interesting the young MPs or candidates mostly found in new parties and yes the PSI I've mentioned before is a new party uh, that organized by some uh, young people in Indonesia that's why they uh, nominate a lot of young MPs a lot, a lot of young uh, candidates but unfortunately fortunately they they haven't all went, want the election. And the fourth one, as I've mentioned before, the way in which parties are managed, whether by young or old administrators, also affects uh, the participation of young people and uh, political parties. And uh, when we talk about uh, the Gen Z, gener, uh, Gen Z political party in, in the uh, po political uh, participation in Indonesia, they have a move from the conventional one to the more dynamic ones. They use social media, social media as a political reference and also a political participation tools. And Mace Bass, uh, maybe in a conventional one, the main space of a political party or political organization is the membership. But in Indonesia, in this digital era, it measured by the number of followers in social media. So it's kind of like imagine community here. And the new political landscape here. Uh, now we are moving, uh, the youth are moving from uh, participating through political parties uh, or wing or uh, cadre organization to the, the uh, digitalization. It's just like, online petition and crowdfunding and a uh, right opinion in, in the captions of uh, Instagram or in Twitter and uh, any other social media and makes memes and also video blogging or vlog. Then when we talk about driven factor of political participation tends not to be based on ideology, uh, but and uh, uh, things that will that, that that is important to the nation it's just like uh, the uh, welfare and then also the anti-corruption so they are not uh, talk about uh, this is my ideology and that's your ideology so we are different no they're not talking about ideology or they're not talk about religion uh, anymore uh, I'm uh, Islam and you're uh, question so we we are different and we have uh, different uh, aims and movement no but they are talking about uh, national interests this is the things that uh, they're fighting for and the fifth one is they like to be called as influencer that's why uh, I think uh, maybe this is uh, one of the factor why the young MPs is uh, uh, the, the lack of young MPs in Indonesia because they don't like to be called as okay I'm I'm a parliament member I am uh, 
what I am a president, but they like to be called as I'm influencer. That's uh, by 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 labeling themselves as influencer, they can uh, what they can influence, they can share, they can uh, what they can uh, say that I'm here. This is uh, I'm here for my country. This is my participation and in, in the political life, and I have my own way. That's why they they are uh, like to be called as influencer. And the last one is uh, idealistic. Their political attachment uh, to the public good. It's related to the fourth factor, and not to the certain religion races or any other social factors they don't like corruption they want peace and better life for indonesia but in uh, a very different way so not in a conventional or not in a formal uh, political channel but in their own world in their uh, social media in their digital life and uh this is uh, quite interesting today. This is the current controversial actions of young uh, youngsters in Indonesia. So they made memes that maybe we're gonna say that it's rude because they are making fun of our president, of our uh, of our vice president, also chairwoman of parliament. They say that. Uh, Mr. Jokowi is the king of lip service. They say that Mrs. Puan Maharani is the queen of casting. They say that Mr. Maruf Amin is the king of silence. They did it because they uh, want to critics the government. They think that by doing uh, this kind of things, uh, social media is uh, beyond uh, time and space. So it will uh, agitate it the more uh, miss, the more uh, followers, so that they uh, they made this maybe root means to protect the government. The kings of lip service because they maybe they are tired and disappointed to the Mr. President for not completing some of his political promises. It's according to them. And for the uh, our vice president, they say that he is a king of uh, silent because it, it, he they they judge that he was less active responding to some problems in Indonesia, especially when we are facing uh, this pandemic. They think that uh, Mr. Maruf Amin just just keep silent and uh, looking for safe uh, place and. And yeah, didn't 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 solve anything in in the end of point of view. And for Mrs. Puan Maharani, the queen of ghosting is to show their disappointment due to the delay, some delay process of some bills. It's quite interesting because uh, it's become controversial. Some people uh, say that hey, it's good. This is a political participation. Uh, the youth, the student, can be a controller for the government. But some people say that, according to the government, uh, they say that it's a route. It's it's not a how you critics, how you uh, say your critics, especially to to the government that is older than them. So yeah, it's 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 quite uh, interesting now. And still happen. This is the government responses. Uh, the government still can fully accept young people harsh criticism with their new style. The government talk about politeness. You should be polite in uh, delivering your critics. Then maybe because the government didn't understand how the youngsters nowadays talk and think. So uh, it become political euphemism. The government even what uh, at the end the government uh, neglect the essence of their critics. But on the other hand, the government actually tried to be useful in governing the country. So it, it, it is 
uh, quite contradictive uh, responses from the government of our youth uh, characters and politics today. And political parties' responses, they also want to be claimed as I'm a youthful party, but they still uh, did nothing. They still uh, do their uh, what? Uh, their usual business. Yes, political party that is that is uh, not dynamic as youth uh, culture and only uh, some of party that can what adapt it to the youth uh, characters today. And it's mostly happen in new parties. And but it's quite interesting because uh, for our next for our next uh, election, the most of the party tries to what to nominate young figure, and it, it in order to to what to to gain the youth uh, participation and to gain the youth votes for them, and yeah, it's it's quite interesting. The political party still uh, didn't change their culture still all this but they are trying to be youthful by uh, what by nominating the youth figure in it and my final notes youth noity has their own path in participating in politics i like what i've said they they don't like to uh what to follow the conventional political channel they have their own channel the uh, digital uh, in, in this digital era by by uh, using their social media and it it it, it is the thing that should be uh, managed by the government political parties and also any other stakeholders because their idealistic should be managed well to make a better life for indonesia to to make uh, what? To make uh, more uh, dynamic participation of Indonesia's people. Thank you. Maybe uh, we can discuss uh, later in the discussion session. Wonderful. Thank you very much for your insightful. Uh, presentation about the situation in, in Indonesia here. So now we have, I, I, I would say, the varieties of youth politics in Asia here. So um, it's a contrast to not only to the uh, Thailand, uh, but also to South Korea. Indonesia, in my opinion, is very interesting because the youth uh, try to uh, express themselves in say, uh, cautiously, depoliticized form or personalized form here so that uh, they're using some, some social media uh, in the form is similar with the South Korea or Thailand, but the content is different. So this is the one of the merit to be a, a uh, have the comparative perspective here. So let's complete this, this comparative picture here with the presentation from Mr. Sunil uh, Waniak Chi uh, from Sri Lanka. And, and we are still waiting for the uh, India's, the Professor Guru uh, Prakashi. Uh, so, so let's first uh, have the uh, Senil, Mr. Sunil Waniak Raj Chi's presentation first. Okay, welcome to our uh, forum here. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor. It was also very uh, interesting to listen to all of the other uh, presenters as well. Uh, we clearly have so much in common as well, even though we are from uh, so many different countries. Of course, there are differences in terms of context and nuance and so on. Uh, but I think uh, some of the challenges that we are facing and, and resisting uh, might be very similar as well. Uh, so that was very interesting uh, for me. Um, in, in Sri Lanka, if you look at the, the past uh, few years, uh, there's been a centralization of power, especially uh, in the office of the, the president. Uh, with the elections we had um, last year and the year before, the presidential election and the parliamentary election after that, 
Uh, there were amendments that were brought to the constitution. So the 20th amendment to the constitution, uh, which substantially increased the powers of the president. Um, so removed some of the checks and balances, uh, including kind of there were independent commissions that were set up. Uh, and so reducing powers of those commissions, including uh, the elections commission, the human rights commission, and so on. Uh, also some of the other uh, checks and balances uh, on the president as well. Uh, for instance, the ability to take the president to court and so on. Uh, so some of these checks and balances were uh, removed. Uh, so currently there is uh, substantial power uh, in the president as opposed to, for instance, the parliament uh, uh, in Sri Lanka. Uh, there has been um, criticism mm -hmm. of this. Also, uh, there are also concerns that this has led to kind of increasing militarization. Mm -hmm. Uh, because the president, the current president, is also a former uh, military uh, person, so he often relies on the the military uh, to to, for instance, for civil administration, for COVID nineteen response, and so on, uh, as opposed to the cabinet and the civil uh, administration uh, processes as well. Uh, so that's been an increasing uh, concern uh, in the country. Um, also, as you, as all of you know, there is, there has been an, uh, an an ethnic conflict in Sri Lanka uh, between the government forces and and, uh, and a group called the LTTE, uh, the Liberation Tigers of Tamilila, uh, which was brought to an end in 2009 uh, by the government military. Uh, but since then, there are also ongoing concerns about um, about the rights of different minority communities in the country as well. Um, it's in the, the Tamil community, but also the Muslim uh, minority as well. So after 2009, there's been uh, growing tensions um, between uh, some of the Buddhist groups and, and uh, the Muslim uh, minority in the country, uh, which have also uh, raised lots of concerns. And during the pandemic as well, this has intensified in some ways. Uh, some of you might know that Sri Lanka was one of the only countries in the world which didn't uh, permit uh, burials for uh, COVID-19 uh, victims for a long period and for a lot of people this was perceived as an anti-Muslim policy uh, because uh, burials were uh, uh, was kind of the only acceptable format of, uh, of, of, burial, of uh, dealing with death uh, among the, uh, the Muslim community as opposed to cremation. Uh, of course the policy was brought to an end about a year later um, but, um, but there were growing concerns uh, as well. Um, so, um, so of course, on the one hand, there is questions around democracy and accountability, and then there are also concerns around uh, ethnic tensions and and relationships between uh, the majority community and the minority uh, communities uh, as well. Um, and like some of the other uh, panelists said, young people are also dealing with uh, quite a conservative uh, culture as well. Uh, so, um, quite deeply held patriarchal uh, attitudes. Um, quite, quite a homophobic uh, culture as well with hetero, heteronormative standards and so on. Uh, so one of the few countries in South Asia where kind of homosexuality is still criminalized, uh, unlike India and some of the other neighbors. Uh, so, uh, so that's also a concern for a lot of uh, young people as well. Um, with like, uh, like I think in all of the other contexts, there is also disparity in income uh, between the haves and the have-nots in the country. Uh, this has also created lots of concerns, um, especially for some kind of the lowest uh, segments of uh, the, the economic uh, spectrum, uh, especially during COVID-19 as well, uh, which has resulted also in some ways of brain drain. Uh, so a lot of young people trying to uh, travel to the West and, and so on, um, looking for better economic opportunities, uh, which is also having long-term impacts on our own economy because uh, the labor force participation and so on is getting uh, affected. Um, so that's all just kind of, uh, I guess, uh, information about the context of the country and so on. If you look more specifically at uh, youth participation, uh, again, like in some of the other uh, contexts as well, youth participation is, uh, is increasingly low. Uh, there is um, kind of big disparities between uh, in, in terms of representation of young people in higher levels of decision making. Um, if you look at kind of, I think the average age of a cabinet minister is around 65 years of age. Uh, so it's extremely, uh, extremely uh, kind of older demographics. But there are also young people in certain um, high level positions. Uh, but it's worth questioning who these young people are, uh, which is one of the problems uh, I wanted to raise uh, as well. 
uh, for instance, one of the most powerful uh, cabinet ministers in the country is a young person, well, relatively young person in his 30s. Uh, but he is kind of uh, the, the son of the prime minister and the, 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 the son, the, the nephew of the president. So I think while we advocate for youth participation, we also need to question who, um, which kind of youth uh, should be represented as well. Because um, uh, it's often, um, it's often results in a hugely kind of nepotistic uh, environment where kind of the, the sons and uh, it's often sons, but rare in rare cases also daughters of current politicians or kind of take over the roles of their uh, either dead or aging parents, uh, which is unfortunate. Of course, I have nothing uh, against kind of sons and daughters of politicians getting into politics, but the vast majority of people in politics currently are sons and daughters of uh, either dead or really aging politicians, uh, which is unfortunate because uh, this is really a result of uh, the political parties themselves. Uh, so even the most progressive political parties that advocate for democracy and so on have quite entrenched constitutions for the political parties uh, themselves. So the, the constitution of the party itself, which are actually quite hierarchical, and decisions are made by a very few people about how the party operates. Often when a senior politician leaves, they often very, uh, try very hard to make sure that the next generation of their family are represented uh, very in very senior positions of the party as well. Uh, so I think while we advocate for kind of constitutional reform and reforming the laws of the countries, we need to make sure that the institutions like the political parties themselves are inclusive because it's actually the parties that uh, work towards uh, making our countries more representative. Um, just to end on a more positive note, because I've also uh, spoken uh, about a lot of the issues, uh, like in all of the other countries, uh, technology is also uh, in some ways uh, making things more hopeful. It's given people a platform to ask questions, put, uh, put politicians on the spotlight, uh, raise uncomfortable issues. Um, and in, in some cases, like in Indonesia, even make fun of uh, bad decisions made by politicians. So I think that's opened up the space uh, in a lot of ways. Um, but of course, the concerns are that one, there is also um, suppression of, in some ways, uh, dissent and things like that. Uh, because on the one hand, there is kind of fake news and disinformation and hate speech and so on online. Uh, but on the other hand, the government decisions that are attempting to address these issues don't really deal with the disinformation and the hate speech, but they use the laws on disinformation and hate speech to target dissent and journalists and activists. So of course there is a real fake news problem, uh, but the laws that are meant to address that problem are not really used to uh, kind of deal with the, the actual people creating the fake news, but it's actually the people asking uh, questions from the government, which might make them kind of uh, uncomfortable or embarrassed. So those are the people uh, that are getting targeted. So on the one hand, the internet is opening things up, uh, freeing the space, but on the other hand, uh, it's also still being controlled to a large extent. Um, and finally, uh, even though the internet also comes off as a more organic space where everyone is kind of open to ask questions and so on, uh, with my work and, and, and to, uh, with my work, I also know that, and, and a lot of you also know that it's also not organic. A lot of these things are also organized. So there are paid groups that are creating content, uh, either critical of the government or for the government. Uh, so it's also not just you know every young people who are asking these questions, but organized campaigns. Uh, Facebook, for example, calls this coordinated inauthentic behavior. So it's not authentic. It's not organic content. It's coordinated behavior that's uh, that's doing these as part of organic. Uh, that's doing this as part of organized campaigns. Um, so those are the points that I really uh, wanted to make, uh, and I'm also hoping to uh, engage during uh, the rest of the uh, discussion as well. Uh, thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much for your insightful presentation uh, about the situation of Sri Lanka here. And obviously, um, the, the, we have real uh, diversities in terms of youth politics uh, across nations, as well as uh, the over time within nations here. So um, the I, I don't want to uh, the repeat uh, the the tough tense the the um, presenters uh, already give us uh, the, the the information here. So just just 
Uh, let's move to uh, just Q&A session. And first I will take up the, the uh, questions from the uh, audience here. I think that you can open the Q&A uh, windows, then uh, you can see we have two questions from the audience. First one for the, uh, the Mr. Watanasku, uh, it's, it's about the situation of Thailand. So, uh, so it said, while the protest used to be a conflict between yellow shirts and red shirts, as far as I know, uh, there are a few those political ideological conflict found in recent protests. So what do you think uh, helps to unite the whole nation as one? And do you believe people's demonstration will be successful in spite of a special backup from the Ramar monarchy here? That's the question uh, to the Mr. Wananescu. And the second one uh, is uh, for the uh, donor here. So uh, you said that the uh, Indonesia's uh, MPs in the 20s and 30s make up 11% of total number of MPs here. It is still high compared to South Korea. Are they coming from the established political families? In case of South Korea, younger MPs in 20s and 30s are only 4.4%. It is very tough for a younger person get elected in South Korea. So this is the just just compared based on the comparative uh, assessment. So, uh, so what what's what what happened in, in Indonesia in terms of the higher level of the and is the representation in the um, parliaments in terms of the number of MPs here. So let's first have uh, the, the uh, questions from the audience. Uh, why the start with the Mr. Watanask? You can, you can answer to this question yep. and then uh, donor, you can respond to the second question here. Well, thank you very much for this terrific question. And yeah, you are right, the, the conflict uh, in the last decade, 10, more than 10 years ago, you will see that, oh, Thailand, they have the yellow shirts and the red shirts. So, easily speaking, uh, the focus of the conflict in the last decade is about one man, Thaksin Chinawat. Uh, he, he, is the, he's, he was a former prime minister, you know, and he, he, he is the only elected leader who served the full year term, you know, and his party, you know, won the, the most number of MP, you know, so he has become the uh, charismatic leader and he has power, very, very, very powerful and influential. So what is the yellow shirt? The yellow shirt is the movement that opposed taxing, you know what, right? in, in the late 2005 to early 2006. Uh, and then we had the, the student six school in September, right? That house taxing from the office. And then we had the red shirt. So with, with the red shirt, red shirts mostly they are the, the taxing supporter. And also they claim to they they they, they claim to be uh, the, the the people who believe in democracy and you know, most of them, you know, it, it can be, it, it, is, it is arguably, it is arguable, right? Most of them, in the, they are in the rural area. Why in the, why the yellow shirts, they are the, the urban middle-class people. Uh, this is the focus of the con political conflict in Thailand over the last decade. So, as I said earlier, we had another coup in, in 2014. And the junta, they were in power for five years, right? For five years, and they transformed itself to be so-called elected government. You know, the new landscape that we can observe in the last, in the recent election, is that the landscape has changed. The focus is not just about you like taxing or not. It's about are you okay with the with the military regime? Are you okay with the youth? If you are okay with the youth, you vote for uh, the junta sponsor party. If you're not okay, then vote for other parties. Uh, so the focus of the political landscape then moved to 
the military junta, especially its leader, for you, Chan Tuosha, yeah, you're right, the conflict has transformed into this, uh, the, the military. So the next question, what helped unite the nation as one? <laughs> this is a great question. Why? Why many people, you know, turn to come together and say, but you get out, you know, military get out. I would say it is about the military junta's legacy, you know. Too many people, uh, they have witnesses to military coup in, in, in their generation, you know, in 2006 and 2014. And they have experienced that the coup took the country to nowhere, you know, and it's time, okay, we, we no longer want the military to be in politics, right? And one of the most interesting thing is that, you know, many people who, who claim themselves to be as the yellow shirts in the past, you know, despite they are against Taksin, you know, until today, but when we choose, choosing between Taksin and the military, and, and Prayut, oh, Prayut is totally unacceptable leader today, right? So this help people come together. And what, uh, what helped this uh, phenomenon, you know, accelerate this phenomenon is the COVID-19 pandemic. You know, today Thailand's have about 17,000 to 20,000 infected cases every day until uh, even today and more than 200 deaths. So it, it has, the, the, the Prayut and the history team has been proved that they are incompetent to, to, not to, to tackle the pandemic and the economic crisis. So, and the next question, will this movement be successful? I have, and you know, I have questioned this, this uh, movement since the beginning. Will it be successful? If we, you know, if we fight with the weapon, yeah, we, we will always lose, right? But the, the, the conflict today is not just about who has more gun, who has more, you know, weapon to, you know, to suppress each other. It's about, uh, it's about how to spread. It, it, is, a, it is a conflict of the, the thought, the idea, the ideology, what to make Thailand a better place is a uh, military regime. An answer, I would say, many people would say, no, we, we no longer want the military to be in politics. Uh, when, 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 when we talk about uh, the current situation in Thailand, I, I, have an, I have looked back to what South, Korean, South Korea experienced back in 1960s, 70s. In at that time, people might say, oh, the movement might be, you know, might, might be not be successful. But later, it has proved that eventually people, you know, the democracy will, will be settled. So Thailand in Thailand, I would say, if you ask to, if you ask the protester, they, they truly believe that democracy will come to the country one day. But if you ask the power holders, they would say, I will use every means, you know, to suppress, to stop any resistance, to prolong my, our power as long as, as, our, as, as we can. But I, I believe in nature. <laughs> you have, we have a bit of change right now. Thailand is facing a change, not just change in, in generation, but society, economy, and even people start, you know, it's seven, eight years ago, oh, no, 2014, some Thai people, they, are, they were very happy. Oh, finally, the military came in to oust uh, Ying Lak Shin. What Ying Lak is Taksin, sister. The un unity and peace and order will return to the country. But seven years and almost eight years has passed. These people say, this is not the answer. And the evidence we have seen every day, every day. So to, to conclude my answer, I would say it will be successful, but it's not just within in the days or weeks. 
it might be five or 10 years. We, ha we have to see. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. So let's have the response from uh, Donner. Okay, uh, thank you for the question for uh, Mr. or Mrs. Lee here. So uh, uh, this is a nice information about the comparative study between uh, Indonesia and Korea. I thought that 11% uh, is a very large number, but unfortunately, South Korea is only 4.4%. And when you ask me, are they coming from the established political families? Yes, because we know that uh, uh political kinship in indonesia is quite high here and when we uh let's say the three youngest uh mps here is uh, a daughter and son from uh the the the, the last uh, uh they they let's say hillary brigitta the one of the youngest uh, MPs in Indonesia. She is a daughter of uh, MPs member in the past. And then uh, the, the two others, young MP, I, I, I a bit, I'm a bit forget the name, but they also uh, the daughter and son of a political figure here. So yeah, maybe it becomes uh in one side it, it becomes uh what privilege for them to win the election but on the other side kinship and politics it's it's not good because uh it 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 then can become a political dynasty here and we also can say that oh yeah you are elected because of your father because of your mother we we don't know your capacity that's that's the negative one of uh, can shape of a dynasty in politics. But uh, besides, they come from established uh, political family. They also come from wealth family. We know that uh, electoral system in Indonesia is uh, open PR list, so the people vote uh, the candidates directly, and it's a uh, kind of a high cost election. And when, and th there are tacit statements that say that when you have a lot of money, then you will win. And it's also happened to the young MPs because they come from wealth family. They have, uh, the, let's say they are rich. So they can uh, did uh, what? A spectacular uh, campaign that time. So people know them well and the people then uh, elect them. So the political kinship and also uh, the financial resources is a factor that, what, that driven them to be elected in the election. That's the two factors. Okay, thank you very much for your uh, answer here. So uh, just, just uh, because we, um, um, we, we know more, uh, we don't have uh, any more questions from the audience. So just, just um, because I have a lot of questions uh, uh, about your presentations here. So just let me, uh, let me raise uh, three questions here. One for the uh, South Korean uh, presenters, one for the Sri Lanka uh, presenters, and uh, one for the all of you here. So for the uh, Gyeongdong, uh, so I, 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 I fully agree with your analysis of the situation in South Korea, uh, especially in terms of youth politics here. And, and then one of the, say, uh, hopeful elements uh, among this, some 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 sort of the dark, uh, the 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 uh, mood in, in South Korea is, as you said, uh, we have for the say for the first time in in our the uh, the political history since the uh, the foundation of our nation here, we have uh, very young political party leader 
in, in one of the largest conservative party in, in South Korea. That's that's unprecedented. And I agree with that. That's the, some some um, some the very important uh, the political events here. But at the same time, I have to uh, say that being young does not necessarily mean uh, the representing young here. So that, that's that's the real question in, in my opinion. So what's what's the possible implication of the selecting a uh, young leader in the one of the largest political party in, in, in South Korea uh, democracy. So uh, you, you can say there might be some positive implication as well as some negative implications. So that's my question for you. For the uh, Sunil, um, I, 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 I have a, a lot of interesting uh, the information from your presentation and, and you, you have confirmed that the uh, youth politics, uh, the, the characteristics of youth politics is totally dependent upon the context of that country. And your country is now suffered from constitutional crisis and the pandemic crisis, the, and, and a bubble, the, some, some sort of the ethnic conflict as well here. So there are multiple uh, privileges and divisions in the population that, that divide not only younger and older people, but also say, for example, uh, gender or the uh, religions or the, as you said, the ethnic here. So my question is, because Sri Lanka is among uh, our uh, the, the, the presenters, you are somehow, uh, in my opinion, well known that what's the implication of this multi-divisional uh, or multi-privilege uh, the political cribbage, uh, uh, the impact on, say, the, the, the youth politics. It, it, it is the, just the structural hindrance of the representing the interest of youth or this some sort of the multi, uh, the, 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 the multi cribbage division might be somehow, uh, some, some, somehow could be some driving force to have some uh, larger coalition, uh, so in, in, in which uh, not only the younger people, but also the other elements of the society can uh, put together to increase the, for example, the quality of the democracy or the quality of the law, rule of law, so that uh, as a result of that, this, this the multi-divisional society can be somehow facilitate of uh, the, the, or the, the uh, rescuing the uh, represent democracy in Sri Lanka. So, what what do you think this 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 uh, somehow the 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 multi privileges can be can be conducive or hindrance uh, to the, the the representing the youth in in democratic process? That's my question for the panel. Uh, and finally, I have uh, one general question for all of you here. Uh, as as I heard, um, the all of you have mentioned that the social media, including say um, the, the Facebook or the uh, the uh, the other uh, medium uh, platforms here, are utilized by the younger generation to represent themselves and mobilize and organize themselves to to make uh, them vo their voices heard in the traditional political uh, area here. So my question is simple. What do you think? Uh, this role of social media in your country is, is somehow uh, good for improving the situation of youth politics. In other words, the, rep the better representation is possible through the uh, social media or uh, many researchers now uh, have some uh, concerns about so-called, for example, echo chamber effect, which means there has to be some uh, negative feedback effect. If you use the social media frequently, then there might be some opinion polarization so that uh, using the social media is, is not that good to have the uh, better representation as well as the better democracy here. So what do you think? So, using social media uh, to improve the situation of youth politics is a good thing for the uh, your society at large, or 
the, the other way around. So that's my uh, question for all of you. So let's start with the uh, Gyeongdong and then Seno, and then I will uh, give you uh, each of you some opportunity to uh, answer to my question here. Okay, Gyeongdong. All right, thank you for the question. So as I have mentioned about before, um, about two months ago, we had the uh, party election for the leading opposition party uh, in Korea, which is the also the conservative party in Korea. So, re so relatively, uh, as you similarly in many countries, the conservative party is usually kind of kind of age wise older than the liberal party, and all the uh, ideologies and the policies and everything are, are a little tentatively like a little bit older. Um, so. Um, it would be a it would be a, a surprise if it was from the Liberal Party, which is the ruling party right now, who has about 100 and uh, 160 um, seats out of um, 300 uh, people in the General Assembly National Assembly right now. However, the number one um, Conservative Party, which has about 101 or two um, seats out of 300 seats, um, and their leader. Uh, has become uh, Mr. Lee, uh, uh, who is right now, I think, international age, 32 or 33 years old. Uh, he has been in politics uh, for the past 10 years already, 10 to 11 years. So he's not a newbie in the, in, 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 in the area. However, another kind of surprising thing was um, he, he, he was never in, um, he was never a, a congressman before. So he has never won any elections. He has participated and he has uh, he, 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 uh, he was a candidate for the past two or three uh, elections in the past. However, he never got elected. So, I mean, that is, I'm not saying, I'm not judging anything by the fact that he was never a congressman. So, but however, uh, the, 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 another surprise was that although um, he, he, he had a lot of exposure on Korean politi political TV and media and YouTube and Facebook and all the channels in Korea, since he was, you know, he was able to utilize it very, very wisely. And he was very, very good with his speeches and he's very good with his ideas. And, you know, he's younger, so he kind of throws them out um, as well. So people kind of, you know, tuned in when, when he was on TV. So um, based on that and his political experience, he was able to um, win, win uh, become the first, uh, the youngest the youngest um, party leader in Korea, which is, uh, I, I think that that's not a that's not like the end game for the youth in Korea. That 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 alone, I don't think, will change uh, tr a tremendous amount of stuff for the youth in Korea. However, it is a, it is a very very significant start at least, um, and that is because I mean, as you guys well know, the party leader is a party leader, and like a CEO is a CEO. However, he does not have all the power. He still has the board of board of directors to convince. He still has the party uh, members to convince. He still has his 102 congressmen with the average age of 56 to convince. So the app, so he, he has to, you know, has to go to, to win over the, the party, basically. I mean, he has the CEO of, um, title, but he, he, he it still needs time. For, for him to, um, to, to win kind of the, the, the genuine uh, backup of the entire party, including the congressmen and including the party members as well. So in that, um, there are some good sides and, and, some, and some challenges that he, that he, he faces as well. Um, and another thing, as I said, is um, his, um, his, 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 uh, his term is, is will, will probably be, be finished or continued in the next year's uh, national election, president election. So if our if the if the conservative party um, does a good job and makes a president, his um, his leadership will become longer. But if not, it is likely to become a uh, one hit wonder kind of thing uh, as well. But another point that I would like to really really emphasize is not only. Uh, of course, is a you know the, the the party leader being 32 years old is a very big symbol, and it shows a lot, and that shows a lot to the youth, saying that hey, you can do it as well. He's 32, and he has not he's you know he's not from money, you know his parents aren't like from royal family or whatnot, 
but you know he, he he's a party leader of the biggest uh, opposition party in Korea. However, another another thing that that has to be kind of changed, I think, in Korea for younger people to become more involved and participate in politics is um, not only for the national assembly but for the local local assembly, local congressmen. Let's say, um, in order to apply for that for for your district and for your for your province. And for the national um, assembly is um, basically, I mean, you, you you need money. I mean, the money that you spend on 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 running your campaign to run as congressman or whatever, whatever uh, is only backed up if you get above fifteen percent uh, a vote. Um, it'll be backed up by the government by based, by the country basically. But if not, basically you lose all the money that you have spent on on running your campaigns in Korea. And that is obviously like a big, big, big hurdle for any, any, any young youth to challenge themselves and represent, try to represent the other youth in Korea. Um, so, so I mean, that is a, that is not only, you know. So what I'm trying to say is, of course, you know, being having a young, you know, party leader in Korea is a symbol of change. However. There needs to be other systematic and um, other other um, kind of um, kind of um, paperwork wise, like other other uh, other rules and regulations and and uh, concerning elections and everything that needs to be touched uh, as well. Thank you. Okay, wonderful. Thank you very much. Okay, Seno. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for that uh, that really important question. Um, I think um, in Sri Lanka, um, ethnicity and religion have become kind of the main ground on which uh, politics operate. Um, and this has generally been the case since independence from uh, British uh, colonialism. Um, there is some research that shows that kind of this reliance on ethnicity and religion actually began during and kind of in response to colonialism. It doesn't mean that before colonialism, everything was perfect, but caste was actually there before that the most dominant uh, kind of factor that divided people uh, within the country. Uh, but uh, in kind of post-colonial uh, sense, then ethnicity and religion kind of largely became uh, the factor on which people were divided. Uh, this is mostly because uh, kind of in the, the, the model, the legislature that was introduced during colonialism, uh, seats are allocated based on ethnicity and religion. So, um, so there was representation for one single community representative, one Tamil community representative, and so on. So often, then these divisions uh, continued um, in a large extent. Uh, and and to this date, uh, kind of, um, I think ethnicity and religion, like you said, even though there are so many other divisions as well based on gender, sexuality, class, and so on. I don't think a lot of people vote based on those uh, factors, based on gender, based on uh, sexuality, based on class. A lot of people still based lar vote last, largely based on ethnicity and religion. Uh, and because of the demographic composition of the country, for the vast majority of the country, 75% um, are singular uh, people. And within that, about uh, so 70% are Buddhists. So that means the singular Buddhist uh, community is the vast majority of the country and they actually have a big say over who gets to become president and so on. Uh, and historically, the minority communities, the Tamil and the Muslim minority communities have voted uh, uh, for not, uh, for instance, not to, to not the government that's in power right now, the, the Rajapaksa government. Of course, I'm generalizing because there are Tamil and uh, Muslim people who have voted for them and, there are, and so on. Uh, but, but if you look at kind of the voter distribution, the vast majority is, um, is uh, singular Buddhist people. Um, so the voting, uh, the, the, the distribution is such that uh, actually even if all of the other minorities get together, they can't elect, uh, elect a representative, they need a substantial portion of the singular people to uh, sway to that side of the vote um, as well. So like you said, this has created different uh, problems. A lot of political parties are uh, divided based on ethnicities. For instance, there is a uh, there's a Muslim Congress, there's a Tamil National Alliance. So the parties themselves aim to represent different uh, communities' interests. And the mainstream, the major political parties are largely Sinhala and uh, Buddhist uh, political parties. Um, so I wish there was more kind of um, hope, but I think, uh, it, and, um, and I think in terms of kind of um, looking at the future more hopefully, I think we need kind of identities which transcend uh, ethnicity, religion, gender, and so on, uh, and, a, and a much more unifying factor. 
Um, and because that kind of thing doesn't uh, exist now, and a lot of the political parties have failed to create that type of identity, they actually thrive based on these religious identities and the divisions that people have to get elected. Uh, and once they get elected, sometimes they try to pacify them because they need to keep the country going. But to get elected, they use these divisions. Um, so, so that's where we are at the moment, uh, which is not a very, uh, uh, you know, uh, very hopeful picture, but I, that's where we are. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, so uh, now we have, uh, I think, the 20 minutes to go here. So before uh, you respond to my question about the role of social media, here's if you, you, you can open the Q&A uh, window here, then there is a very uh, quick question here. So uh, before the responding to my question, just, just uh, give us the information about this, this quick question. So which issue uh, makes young people in your country angry most? Corruption, injustice, inequality, gender, cultural hierarchy, environment, et cetera, et cetera, and unites youth to act. So that's the quick question uh, to all of you. Okay, so let's start uh, with uh, uh, for which you, you can start the, uh, your response to the questions here. Thank you very much for this question. And this is the, the difficult question for, for me because every, uh, every issue makes the young Thai angry most right now, you know. <laughs> corruption, yeah, authori under the authoritarian regime, we, we know, yeah, corruption is everywhere. Injustice, oh, this is one of the, of the, 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 the issue that makes the young people uh, angry the most, because why? You know, the, 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 the movement leader, just before they organize the movement, you know, just uh, for example, if they, they, they are supposed to host the, 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 the rally today, you know, in the morning, the police will go, go to their house and say, hey, come with me and take a picture, practice. Sure. And most of the movement leaders right now, they are in the pre-trial detention. This is just a quick example that I can, can thought. On the other hand, if you look back on the corruption case about the, the top government uh, officer, the minister, the prime minister, they are always clean. I do nothing wrong. I do nothing wrong. And the institution, you know, um, Help uh, whitewashing to you know various institutions that set up after the the, the coup help whitewash their uh, their 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 profile inequality Thailand if you look at the statistic uh, Thailand is among the most unequal country in the world and it you know when we, we talk about this issue people say oh it's just a, a number a data but under the military regime for over the last seven years, people have sense, you know, this is truly unequal. Our, our, our society is truly unequal. The top 1% of the rich, oh, you know, gain more, gain more rich. Why the more than 90% of the poor feel, feel that, oh, why we work hard, but we don't get more pay, for example. The gender, ah, uh, as we know, you know the, the, the gender equality is among the, the, the trend in, in our world, right? I have observed the, the, the movements against the, the, the current regime uh, for a year. It's not just about for you get out, the military get out, you know. Some group that organized the, the movement, they are calling for the, the equality, gender equality, for example, LGBT. You know, they, they wear the, the, what's it called? Pry, you know, fry, fry costume along the road, you know? And so my quick, quick, my, my quick answer is that all of the issue that, that uh, the audience <laughs> asked are in Thailand today. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, okay, let's have the response from Donna. Okay, uh, thank you. Uh, I think all of the issues 
will make young people angry and also unite to act. But uh, if I may pick the big three of that issue, it's going to be corruption, injustice, and equality. We know that uh, corruption, Indonesia is one of a big corrupt country. Yeah, I, I got to say that. And injustice and inequality. Uh, until now, I think the Gini curve in Indonesia is, is, is still showing us that there, there are still, we still have, yes, the wealth and the not have when it's, it's really, <clears throat> sorry. The wealth and the, the have not, the what? The range between them is is quite high, and I, I, I'm not saying that gender issues, cultural hierarchy, environment is not important to become uh, the youth issue here. But maybe this issues is uh, what this issues has uh, its a uh, specific market. I mean not all the youth concern in gender and also in culture hierarchy and also in environment but uh they they still concern about it but not all the youth concern in it only uh, specific youth even specific uh people concerned in gender but for corruption injustice and equality i think uh all of people, not only the youth in Indonesia is concerned about it because uh, this problem is like what? It's like a circle when uh, there are corruption, it will uh, come to injustice and also inequality. And even in this pandemic era, the corruption is higher than before and it becomes it, and it, it it what it calls youth reaction very big they they i think they they were angry to the government because in this very hard era the corruption even getting bigger getting higher the corruption index is getting higher so that's my answer all of the issues is important for the youth but the big three is corruption injustice and also inequality Okay, good. Thank you very much. Uh, let's move to have the answer from Tong Tong. Sure. Um, yeah. In Korea, also back in the, even until like maybe early 2000 or the 1990s, corruption was a major issue overall in politics and society in general as well. Uh, however, with um, with um, casualties and with um, with um, you know uh, internal kind of um, upgrades and whatnot, um, corruption. I mean, it's still there, of course, but I mean, it's not such a major issue in in terms of um, society and politics at the moment. It's not the biggest issue, at least. However, over the past three four years in Korea, there has been an increase in housing prices that went that went skyrocketed through the ceiling. Uh, houses that were like $100,000, for example, three years ago is like $300,000 right now, for example, in certain regions. So the, the level of inequality, not only for, for the youth, but for, for everyone in general, um, is, is, becoming a, is becoming one of the biggest issues in Korea. And also with inequality uh, follows kind of maybe injustice as well. And there was an incident in Korea where uh, one of our um, ex, um, ex ministers, the minister of um, justice, actually, the minister of justice is the daughter of minister, uh, an ex minister of justice. Um, she, she, her mother, she's, the trial is still going on, but it is alleged that um, her mother, who's also a professor, uh, uh, forged some of our entry papers and helping her to become and going to medical school basically. And, and that became a very, very big, big issue with, among the youth. 
because number one, you know, they are they 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 are now the Korean, for example, housing prices have become way too high. For example, in Seoul, for anyone to even 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 if you work for like twenty years on on a normal salary, you can never buy a house in in Seoul at least. Um, so that comparative kind of void and emptiness is in Korean people's youth. So that's the inequality that the Korean youth kind of feel. Because back in the days, in our father's days, you know, if you work hard and wake up early and, you know, you do what you're told, you know, you save up money, you put money in the bank, you know, you can have a good life and a good apartment and whatnot. But now that's just, just impossible. So that kind of comparative uh, void uh, plus uh, injustice in, um, in the so-called, ha- what, what the so-called haves do uh, in terms of, you know, helping um, their, their, their offsprings, helping their children um, have even better lives is, is, is kind of a big problem at the moment right now in Korea. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, okay, let's have the answer from Seno. Um, yeah, I, I'll keep it uh, quick. Um, and I, I think like everyone said, uh, everything is uh, extremely important. Uh, but if I had to pick two, I will. Um, and if, if I had to pick two, I don't mean these are my favorites, but if uh, thinking of what might be important for young people, um, I think corruption and environment uh, are important. Um, because with other ideas like human rights and, and gender and so on, there is a still some levels of controversy around them. Uh, they are sometimes seen as Western ideas uh, and so on, but issues around corruption and protecting the environment seem to bring everyone together. Uh, so kind of no one, there is generally little opposition for movements against corruption. There's little opposition for movements against protecting the environment. Unlike with human rights issues and with gender issues, they often, when people advocate for them, they're seen as kind of bringing in Western ideas, Western um, issues. Uh, but but you can't do the same with uh, anti-corruption. You can't do the same with protecting the environment. So generally, they seem to be more unifying uh, movements. Everyone seems to agree uh, on those two grounds. Um, so I would say those two. Great. Thank you very much for your the uh, the the enthusiastic uh, response to the question from the audience here. So un- um, unbelievably, we have still. Uh, eight minutes to go here. Uh, that's I, I don't know. That's the byproduct of the uh, the time management of uh, the the uh, chair person here. I, I don't know, but but still we have some uh, time here. So uh, if you have something more to add on the, the the discussion, then I will give each of you just one minute to wrap up here. So just just share uh, with us about your, say, uh, the opinion uh, on on the discussion today. So that's that's the just just last call uh, the the um, uh, request. Okay. So that's that's the so start with the. Uh, Prawit, you can share your opinion about the discussion today with us what, for just in, in one minute, okay? Thank you very much. And it is, uh, for me, is a great opportunity to learn from the comparative perspective. I'd like to, to, conclu- to, to give a final remark before we end the discussion. Let's get back to the question that, 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 that you asked about the social media why it, it matters to youth politics in, in case of Thailand. To me, the social media is the only platform that the youth politics, that, that, that the young Thais can expo- express their voice and their voice are heard under the, uh, the, the authoritarian regime, especially Twitter. So, uh, I mean, the, the, the regime might use every means to, to block, to, to suppress, to or anything, whatever, to control thought, but the social media is a global phenomenon. And this is the only one space that the, the regime cannot, uh, you know, completely dominate and control. And I think I see a good signal for the social media, especially Twitter and Clubhouse for the youth politics in Thailand. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, so uh, Donna. Oh, sorry, Jungdong. Sorry. 
Um, yeah, I mean, I just want to <clears throat> finish by um, saying, I mean, all of us here are one way or the other in academia or in social society involved in youth politics uh, or studying youth politics at the moment. Um, I saw, uh, watched some kind of movie, like I think it was called Departed with Leonardo DiCaprio a couple of days ago. And it said, um, you know, power is never given, power has to be achieved. Um, same with that, um, you know, for, for the youth, not only in Korea, but around the world, um, we, I mean, we, we, we always have to keep knocking for that, for that one, one policy that, that's curated towards us. And we just have to keep on uh, fighting a little bit and asking for what is what is what what should be ours in order to you know for 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 them to cave in and say hey you know we will go in the back alley for you back seat for you now it's your turn to you know to to make a difference in in the world and in Korea as well thank you wonderful uh okay so Donna okay uh. If I might say that youth political participation today has moved from the conventional to the unconventional one through social media. Uh, and one side it's a positive because uh, it's can, it can overwhelmingly spread the information quickly and map the youth characteristic. But on the other hand, uh, we have to remember that social boots that switch function to spread hot news, filter bubbles, echo chambers, and search algorithm on Google or any other social media platform that only shows news ads that match our preferences. And it leads us to a confirmation bias. And when we don't have a good uh, media literacy or political literacy, it, it will brings us to the distortion of democracy. So that's why bringing youth participation to the formal uh, channel one is also important because as the politic of prison is still exists here, we need their participation and a formal channel, formal political channel, so that they can uh, directly influence the policies. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, Sanil. Um, yeah, I. I think to um, close, I just want to, uh, I think this is something I said briefly as well earlier. Um, I think we should advocate for having more young people represented at all levels of uh, decision-making, right from right to the top to the local government. But we should also keep questioning which kinds of young people we want there as well, uh, because young people are also so diverse and young people, as we know, unfortunately, can also be corrupt and authoritarian and and um, and sexist and homophobic and and all of these uh, types of um, issues that that people of all ages have uh, so i think while we advocate for youth representation we need to keep questioning which types of young people we need as well um, and advocate for to make sure that the people who can stand for uh, democracy and those values and also people who can uh, represent the, the kind of the least powerful, most marginalized sectors of our society are in those positions um, as well. Um, yeah. Okay, great. Okay, so uh, I think the, uh, I, I always feel that the, the, the international uh, dialogue with the any kind of topic will be very beneficial for not only for me, but also for the community uh, at large here. So today I also learned a lot. Uh, that's, that's the real benefit for this, this international forum. So I think the, thank you very much uh, for the, 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 uh, the presenters to give us the insightful, uh, the, the idea in, in terms of the youth politics. As well as the, I also thank for the uh, the, the the audience to uh, join us uh, for about the two hours here and and raising uh, the impressive questions here. Uh, thank you very much, and and I believe the ADRN webinar will uh, will going on uh, in the near future, and, and I, we hope I hope uh, we can see each other uh, at, at the new uh, ADRN webinar series. Okay, thank you very much. I will stop here. Thank you.
and, and stay safe and strong.